Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, the surge in futures this morning comes after a volatile session following the Fed's 50 basis point rate cut. The S&P 500 wiped out a 1% gain yesterday after Fed Chair Jay Powell cautioned against assuming big rate cuts would continue. I do not think that anyone should look at this and say, oh, this is the new pace. You have to think about it in terms of the base case. Of course, what happens will happen. So, so in the base case, what you see is look at the SEP. You see cuts moving along. The, the sense of this is we're recalibrating policy down over time to a more neutral level, and we're moving at, at the pace that we think is appropriate. Jay Powell and the Fed's first rate cut in four years was accompanied by projections indicating an additional 50 basis points of cuts across the remaining two policy meetings this year. Well, Nathan, we have plenty of reaction from the Fed rate cut. We caught up with Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Alarian, KMPG chief U.S. economist Diane Swank, and former New York Fed President Bill Dudley. We're going to look back and either this will be the absolutely right bet, which is be preemptive on the labor market after you are reactive to inflation. This is a fundamental change in the reaction function. Or alternatively, we will look at this as being too aggressive. I'm hoping that it will be the first. This was a huge victory for Jay Powell, who really laid out at his Jackson Hole speech that he was worried about employment. And that is what this is about. It's pretty much uh, what I was expecting in the sense that one of the issues that Powell had is how do you do 50 without scaring people that you know something bad about the economy? And I think he did that very well. He basically said, we're doing this because the news is good. We've made progress on yeah. inflation, uh, as opposed to we're doing this because the news is bad. So I thought it was a very, uh, you know, he's providing reassurance uh, to people that the uh, Fed thinks that they've they've got it. That was former New York Fed President Bill Dudley, KPMG Chief U.S. Economist Diane Swank, and Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed Alarian. The decision was not without some controversy. Michelle Bowman cast a dissenting vote in favor of a smaller quarter-point rate reduction. That marked the first dissent by a Fed governor since 2005. Well, uh, Karen, investors aren't the only ones cheering the Fed's rate cut. Bloomberg's John Tucker joins us now. And, John, the Biden-Harris administration may have cause to celebrate as well. Yeah, Nathan, and they're taking kind of a victory lap in a speech today to the Economic Club of Washington. President Biden will celebrate the Fed's decision to slash interest rates as a validation of his economic vision. This is part of an effort to recast his handling of the economy, particularly as uh, voters continue to give him low marks for tackling inflation. It's important for both the president personally and the Democrats more broadly. As Vice President Harris is locked in that tight election battle with Donald Trump, his aides say Biden will outline ways he believes the economy could still be made stronger while pushing costs lower. I'm John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. All right, John, thank you. It's now to the Bank of England, and it's turn to make a policy decision. The BOE is expected to maintain a patient approach to easing at its meeting today after a first rate cut last month. And Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden has more from London. It's decision day on Threadneedle Street, but economists and investors are expecting policymakers to stick to the status quo, holding the benchmark rate at 5%. However, wages are increasing on a faster Bank of England cutting cycle ahead after inflation readings came in lower than central bank forecasts in July and August. Attention will be focused on Governor Andrew Bailey for hints that borrowing costs could be lowered again in November after committee members voted narrowly to end their 16-year high last month. Traders are also awaiting news on the speed of quantitative tightening, a decision which could prove pivotal for new Chancellor Rachel Reeves' October budget. In London, Lizzie Burden, Bloomberg Radio. Okay, Lizzie, thank you. Now we want to get you caught up on the latest developments in the Middle East. Israel has declared a new phase in its regional war with Islamist groups. It comes as Hezbollah officials say explosions went off in Beirut and multiple parts of Lebanon in an apparent second wave of detonations of electronic devices. We get more from Bloomberg's Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. It's a second day of communication devices exploding uh, across uh, not just Beirut, but across the entire country, eastern Bikar, as well as southern Beirut. And this time the catalyst were walkie-talkies. Uh, these were walkie-talkies that Hezbollah group members had been using. Uh, they also exploded, uh, be it in cars, in people's houses, uh, even uh, in with, within cafes. So very similar in nature to the attack that took place the day before. The Lebanese health ministry has put out uh, a statement 
statement saying that 450 casualties were uh, brought into hospitals as a result of these attacks. 20 people have now lost their lives. Bloomberg's Jumana Versace notes Israel has not taken responsibility for the attacks. Now to the latest in the presidential race, Nathan. And former President Trump was on New York's Long Island for a rally last night, and he promised to lift the cap on state and local tax deductions that he imposed as president, but is valuable to many New York homeowners. Trump also announced plans to go to Springfield, Ohio, the city where he said during last week's debate, Haitian migrants have eaten people's pets. I'm going to go there in the next two weeks. I'm going to Springfield and I'm going to Aurora. You may never see me again, but that's okay. Got to do what I got to do. Whatever happened to Trump? Well, he never got out of Springfield. Trump also said he'll go to Aurora, Colorado. He's repeatedly claimed that city has been overrun by migrant gangs from Venezuela. As for Kamala Harris, Karen, the vice president plans to meet with Vladimir Zelensky next week. The Ukrainian president will be in Washington. Sources say he's expected to push his country's bid to join NATO and Europe, the European Union, along with more advanced weapons as part of his victory plan against Russia. Zelensky plans to present that plan to President Biden on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly later this month. Meanwhile, Nathan, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters is declining to endorse a candidate for president, and Bloomberg's Amy Morris has more from Washington. It is a blow to both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Teamsters General President Sean O'Brien released a statement saying that neither candidate was able to make serious commitments to the union, quote, to ensure the interests of working people are always put before big business. Now, the Teamsters released internal polling data showing members had initially favored endorsing Biden over Trump. But after Harris became the nominee, the majority of respondents backed Trump. In polling conducted a few days ago, 58 percent supported endorsing Trump, compared to 31 percent for Harris. And you may recall O'Brien spoke at the Republican National Convention in July, the first time a leader of the union has done so. Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Amy, thank you. We have breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Apple is set to be warned by the European Union that it needs to open up its highly guarded iPhone operating system to rival technologies or eventually risk significant fines. Sources say EU watchdogs are due to announce under the bloc's new Digital Markets Act that Apple must step into line with strict new rules on making operating systems fully functional with other technologies. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Lawyers for Sean Diddy Combs unsuccessfully fought to keep him out of jail after his sex trafficking arrest. The music mogul's lawyers highlighted a litany of horrors at the Brooklyn federal lockup described as hell on earth. They include horrific conditions, rampant violence, and multiple deaths. Combs attorney Mark Agnifano. I told Mr. Combs um, I'm going to try and get his case to trial as quickly as possible. I'm going to try and minimize the amount of time he spends in very, very difficult and I believe inhumane uh, housing conditions in the, in the special housing unit of the Metropolitan Detention Facility. Audio courtesy of ABC7, the judge cited possible witness tampering by Combs if bail is granted. Combs was sent to the Metropolitan Detention Center after pleading not guilty in a case that accuses him of physically and sexually abusing women for more than a decade. Disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein pleaded not guilty to a new indictment charging him with criminal sex acts. According to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, three separate women have accused Weinstein of sexually assaulting them. It's not part of Weinstein's conviction, which was later overturned on appeal. This morning, a judge in Washington, D.C. will sentence five people accused of helping to lead the infamous January 6th initial breach of the Capitol. Prosecutors will recommend nine years in prison, saying this group was among the first to breach a police barricade, saying hundreds, if not thousands, of rioters would follow. A new study finds that preventable risk factors are driving a global increase in strokes. Dr. Valerie Fagan is the director of the National Institute for Stroke and Applied Neuroscience at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Stroke is probably one of the most preventable and yet very fatal and disabling conditions 
Dr. Fagan says strokes kill more than 7 million people each year. The study published in the journal Lancet Neurology finds environmental factors like air pollution and heat waves and individual factors like blood pressure and bad cholesterol are behind the recent increase. Global News 24 hours a day, whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg Karen. All right, Michael Barr, thank you. And it's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashower. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Over the last 30 seasons, the Yankees have gone to the postseason 25 times. Didn't go last year. Barely finished over 500, but headed back. Clinched at least a wild card when they won 2-1 to one in 10 innings at Seattle. Champagne then flowed in the clubhouse. Aaron Judge hoping there's more of that next month. He was on the Yes Network. Oh, well, we're excited. You know, we definitely know the job's not finished. You know, we're hunting this division. Um, so I get an opportunity to, you know, punch our ticket back in the postseason after last year missing out. It means a lot. You know, we got a special group here. The boys are definitely excited, but they know the mission that's, that's definitely ahead of them. The win last night was helped by a bizarre double play in the bottom of the tent. The Mariners had runners at first and third. Nobody out. Randy Arozarena struck out, and his bat went flying towards the head of Julio Rodriguez at third as he got out of the way of the bat. Austin Wells threw to third, and Rodriguez was picked off. Orioles lost again. Yankees moving now towards clinching the division. They lead by five games. At City Field, the night after the Mets won 10 to 1, they won 10 0 over Washington. Jose Quintana went the first seven innings, gave up just two hits. Brandon Nimmo, a three run homer. Arizona and Atlanta both won. The Mets stay tied with the D backs with both teams two games ahead of the Braves. Red Sox won 2 1 at Tampa Bay. Milwaukee clinched the NL Central. Tonight at MetLife, it's the Jets' home opener. New England also won. One and one. First ballot for the Pro Football Hall of Fame is out. It has 16 first timers, including Eli Manning. John Stashower, Bloomberg Sports, Karen and Nathan. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. The Fed is determined to achieve a soft landing. That is the message Chairman Jay Powell sent to markets as the central bank pivots to cutting interest rates with a half percent move. The economy is growing at a solid pace. Inflation is coming down closer to our 2% objective over time. And the labor market is, is still in solid shape. So our, our intention is really to maintain the strength that we currently see in the U.S. economy. That was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, at the news conference following that 50 basis point cut. For more this morning, we are joined by Veronica Clark, U.S. economist at City. Veronica, good morning. You were first out of the gate with this call. You said in July that the Fed was <laughs> going to do 50 basis points. Was this the right call? Yeah, good morning. Thanks for, for having me. Um, I, I do think it, it probably was. Um, of course, in the end, the the decision was very close, and we didn't know what this was going to be going into yesterday, the, the first time in a long time that that's happened. Um, but I do think the argument for, for a 50 basis point cut is strong. Um, even Chair Powell said it, you know, the sense in which if you had had those July employment you know, data points just a couple days earlier, um, maybe they would have cut in July. Maybe you were making up first and lost time. Um, we are never going to be further from a neutral interest rate than when you start cutting. So it makes sense to, to do it right away. At the same time. Powell said, don't get used to it, that this isn't necessarily meaning that it's always going to be 50. You agree with mm -hmm. that? I think the Fed is, is, of course, going to stay pretty optimistic here. And we, we did have you know the updated economic projections yesterday. They only expect the unemployment rate to rise maybe another tenth or two from where we are now, still expecting strong GDP growth. And I think if that plays out, then, and then it's fair that you know the, the pace of cuts would, would slow. Um, but I think for us, you know, we're always trying to you know, first and foremost, base our Fed call on where we think the economic data are headed. Um, and we actually do see the, the chance of more labor market weakness. We do have two more employment reports to go before we get to the next Fed meeting in November. Um, I think there could still be some weakness in the labor market data in those reports. We think they're going 50 again in November because of that. Do you think we need to hear more clarity from Chairman Powell about what the path is going to be for rates, what the size of the cuts is going to be? Is there too much data dependence from this Fed? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think, you know, he, he said it, of course, we're, we're taking it meeting by meeting. Um, it is, you know, really just the, the labor market data now, first and foremost. And I think we do know that they're reaction function to if the data evolve in a certain way, if, if we do see weaker labor market data, 
um, their reaction is going to be to support the labor market as, as much as they can. Um, so we at least understand, I think, that they, they have a pretty sensitive reaction function to any weaker labor market data. Do you think there's still a reaction function to inflation? Is the Fed taking its eye off the ball on inflation too soon? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, that is the the other important element of of their mandate, and I and I don't think you know we're you know dismissing inflation altogether. But I actually was a bit surprised um, that we did have this stronger CPI reading you know last week, and we thought maybe you know the the best compromise then among the hawks and the doves was to just do a a twenty five even yesterday. Um, but clearly, you know, the the labor market is is taking precedent here. Um, I think you know, we had an even response from Chair Powell about the the stickiness of shelter inflation, and he was somewhat dismissive of that. Um, so I think the you know, focus for the Fed is just very quickly shifting to the labor market data. And speaking of the split between hawks and doves in our last minute here, uh, how significant was it that uh, Governor Bowman dissented on this decision? Yeah, not not surprising at all. She is certainly probably the most hawkish Fed official. Um, I was actually even maybe a bit surprised that there weren't more dissents. Of course, the, the market was very 50-50 split on, on what the size of the cut was going to be. Um, we really didn't know up until the last minute. I would have thought maybe there were even some more hawks, you know, arguing for, for starting a bit smaller. Um, so I don't think that dissent is, is too meaningful. If anything, um, this is more consensus than I, I would have thought in a, in a split decision. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, your morning podcast on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed by 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Blue. Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 929 in Boston, and nationwide on Sirius XM Channel 121. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app now with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto interfaces. And don't forget to subscribe to Bloomberg News Now. It's the latest news whenever you want it, in five minutes or less. Search Bloomberg News Now on your favorite podcast platform to stay informed all day long. I'm Karen Moscow. And I'm Nathan Hager. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.